of Integrative Medicine at Trinity Health of New England, I want to welcome you to this week's installment of Wellness Wednesday. Wellness Wednesday is designed to bring in brief format tools for wellness that will benefit you, our colleagues, and our communities at large. I'm Dr. Kathy Muller, and I'm here with my colleague Tim Michaels today for another Wellness Wednesday edition. It's been such a good couple of weeks, I have to say. Tell me, what's been going on? So we have our first location for integrative medicine. It's open, and we've had this lovely return of people who are ready to start take caring, taking care of themselves again. And also, um, this, this new group of people, we're seeing a lot of people with post-COVID syndrome, and we're really being able to help them through this long haul, this, uh, this post-COVID syndrome um, symptoms. And so, it's been really interesting getting this new team going and being able to jump back into integrative medicine. So, I just, I'm curious, as you've been chatting with people coming in, kind of returning to self-care, it's one of our signs that we feel like we're I hate that phrase, returning to normal. I, I, I struggle with trying to find the right words, but it's starting to enjoy things we used to be able to enjoy freely before, right? Coming back to that. Plus the, the post-COVID care, the long haul symptoms. Have you noticed any interesting themes or stories amongst people? Yeah, it has been really interesting. And both our patients who have post-COVID syndrome, but also everybody has this, um, I don't know what it is, maybe a little bit of hesitancy, maybe a little bit of uh, unsureness as they kind of come back into what this new place is. And, and I think you're exactly right. We'll never go back to the way that we were before COVID. We can't, and honestly, we shouldn't. I think we need to, to figure out what moving forward means. And I think some of that insecurity, I certainly have it. I mean, not having a mask on in some places is so so unsettling. And then it kind of brings us back to what we've done over these past 15, 16 months. We've done quite a lot. We've gone through quite a lot. And so I think it's bringing up a, a lot of that. There's not one of us who has not been touched in some really challenging way by COVID-19, either with knowing somebody who suffered from it or a death in the family or dealing with, with really hard illness and death in a hospital setting. Um, right. We can't go back, right? Right. So it, it started maybe four or five weeks ago. I started doing some research, and it really kind of came to a head you know, around the same period of time, two, three weeks ago, talking to a really good friend of mine. And they were expressing um, this malaise. They kept to referring to it as, I'm just blah, blah, blah. And typically we mean we're skipping part of a conversation, but that I'm just blah. Oh, pale, um, everything's going okay. So my children are happy, my grandchildren are healthy, uh, work is even starting to go better. Uh, and especially in healthcare, that's an interesting thing to hear. But she couldn't kind of um, understand why then was she feeling so blah. And it was a difficult conversation that's been going on for three weeks now. So I started doing more and more research into the symptoms of stress. Um, what the symptoms look like when you put them next to the long haulers, what it looks like for stress-induced depression, and then I ended up in the arena of grief. Mm -hmm. And it started to make a lot of sense to me. So I, I'd rather use the word loss right now. Uh, grief, especially in Western language, usually is signifying the death of someone, and clearly there's been so much of that. But I think on a more global level, in addition to and honoring those lives that have passed, has been this other level of loss. So the, the real definition of grief is something that was in our life, something or someone that no longer is. Mm -hmm. And we feel it. And in a conversation, say finally three weeks later, we talked about this notion of shouldering through the last 15 months in that high state of alert, right? So that fight or flight, uh, we have a lot of well, only one chemical kind of cortisol in our system. And, and we know from the, the grief side of it that grief pushes that cortisol because you're trying to figure out how to be safe. But long-term exposure to that level of cortisol also interferes with our executive functioning, our frontal cortex. Yeah, it definitely so it, does. It creates that I can't get out of my own way, I'm feeling connected, don't know what to do. And I feel 
out of context to the world. The world is starting to come back. I don't feel joyful, right? I feel sad. And, and so we were talking, you and I, one day around honoring the emotions we're feeling. And I want to be careful. I mean, there's very clear stages to grieving the loss of someone or something. But I think if we all could be honest and take a step back, um, we really are exhibiting them. We absolutely are. We absolutely are. And all in our own way. There's not one prescribed way to go through a loss. And I think so often we kind of get stuck in, oh, it's been this long, you should get over it. But it, it's just not that prescribed. It's so individual. And I think that's where um, we're all feeling just a little out of balance, right? We just have to get our feet back under yeah. us and we just can't, we're just not finding it. We're just not finding it. Um, as people are watching this video, there'll be resources and references that I'll put up at the end. I don't want to distract us with it now. There's some great articles and websites that I've come across that are very um, factual and, and get to the point without a lot of extra words. And I, and I think for people who are experiencing this level of feeling, sadness, um, it, it's important to try to get something crisp and clear. Um, I just want to do a few things, Kathy. I'm even struggling trying to talk about it now because it produces a vulnerability it does. to take a deep breath and just say, I'm fine, but I'm sad. Yeah. You know, so one of the things psychologists are really noticing in terms of, let's say, the loss of a loved one is even during this last 15 minutes, the loss of the ability to have our ceremonies, our funerals, our gatherings, uh, sitting Shiva, all the things that help us move forward. So intellectually, we know what's happened, we know why it happened. We have not been able to move forward. And we all know intellectually that grief is one of those friends that just doesn't go away until their work is done. Um, they will wait patiently. They have the patience of Job, so to speak, our friend grief. And, and that sadness and loss will wait for you. And it just shows up. So the other thing we've noticed, and as I've been talking to this friend, was as our defenses have kind of come down, we don't feel the need to shoulder through every day exactly the same way, um, our vulnerability comes up. And that's where these feelings. So that's one level of it, the loss of our traditions and ceremonies. Most of us had the way that we would reach out and get some help. We would get together with a close friend, go take a walk, gatherings, that social contact has been available, but I don't know that it's quite the same through FaceTime or Zoom or WebEx as being able to sit with somebody you trust and just feel the way you want to feel. Yeah, it's right? just a little more artificial. And and you know, and you and I both know that gathering in person, there's an energetic presence that happens. And we have been so separated from that energetic presence over these past whatever, year and a half now almost. And that too has got to have some sort of effect on us that we're all feeling now. And just trying to figure out how do we literally reconnect? How do we literally reconnect and become right these new people we are. Right. And so if we can, um, I want to see if we can explore a couple of uh, tips that people could take a deep breath and step back and kind of do a simple self-assessment. Um, I don't think I said that right. Self-assessment. <laughs> <laughs> it came out backwards. Um, I, I always appreciate the fact that no matter what I'm going through, I seem to be able to find a way to laugh at something. That's a good sign, I think. But, um, for example, one of the things that really got my attention uh, about where I am is not the research and the reading. It's finally noticing some of the simplest mistakes I'm making because I, can't, I keep thinking I can't get my focus sharp enough. I can't get my focus sharp enough. But I don't want to actually look at why I, I'm seeming to get stuck. Um, and I shared the story quickly with you the other day. In the middle of a heavy rainstorm, is when I realized I had put new windshield wipers on the car and never took <laughs> off the protective plastic cover. So I was really angry that they weren't working. And that, so I went down the path of, they're not working, it's pouring rain, I'm gonna get soaked, there's no quality control, people don't wanna take jobs. They wanna <laughs> understand, this is why my windshield wipers don't work. 
everybody else's fault, an irrational, angry response. And then all of a sudden it hit me like a ton of bricks at a traffic light as the sun ran lightning. I didn't remove the simple white <laughs> plastic cover from the black windshield wiper. Like it couldn't have been any clearer. So when this, uh, to me, I'm starting to realize you, you really need to take a step back and try to get a little more honest about what you're feeling before something bad actually happens. I think that level of cortisol that you were talking about, um, we know that when people are going through cancer treatment, for example, we talk about chemo brain. And really some of the research is showing us it's not the chemotherapy, it's the stress. It's the idea that you're doing something new, that your life is potentially threatened, that you have um, all of this stuff that you now have to deal with that two months ago you didn't have to deal with. And I feel like that's sort of where we are with COVID. We've gotten through. We've pushed through, just like you said, shouldered on through. And now we have the repercussions of being in that fight or flight mode almost constantly for the past year and whatever. Um, and right. so we do need that time to kind of separate, separate and settle and reflect back and see where we are. Really grounding, like getting ourselves grounded once again. Right. And so the, the other thing I started doing, and, and it's not to make a bleak picture, it's just to be honest about things, um, is to try to make a list of where, where, what were the things I was doing that I got power from, energy from, positive, right? And which were the ones that I've stopped, but it's been so long, I'm not even aware of the impact their absence has, right? Um, so if I were to put myself in the position, let's say, of a parent with an elementary school child, who's being homeschooled. I may not realize I don't like being a teacher. I didn't set out in life to be a teacher, and I've heard parents say this, but I don't, haven't heard anybody talk about the loss of their freedom. It could have only been five minutes, but that five minutes is now gone for a year and a half as you've been trying to be teacher and worker and spouse, elder care person, all those things that over a 15-year period, that five-minute freedom every day is now built up. You just don't have it. And the other thing is, is the belief that there's an end in sight. I think that's been my other trigger point, is I'm not sure that the worst is over, right? That's that I'll absolutely. ever feel okay again, which again is another one of those moments from the grief cycle. Yeah. Yeah, you, you struck a chord with me when you were talking about just can't get back into the things that we used to enjoy. Just this morning, I usually get up and I do yoga, and I have not done yoga in more than a year. And I got up this morning and I thought, well, that's silly. You feel much better when you do it. Why can't you do it? There's no answer. There's no answer except we are in COVID, and we just it just went out of the way and I can't get myself back in there. So I did it this morning. So that was, you know, one day down. Let's see if I can keep it up. Right. It doesn't take long. And I think it's, it's that pause when we look and say, I wonder why I feel this way. I wonder how, what's the next step to pull myself out of this or find some tool or some person or some connection. Right. And without right. that pause, we, we, we just miss it. And I think I've, I've missed that part for a very long time. So I, we could talk about this for hours and hours. So there's, so there's two things though, is a um, few things I just want to share with people. Um, to, we're talking to an audience primarily of our colleagues, but also the community at large, which is full of educated clinical ed teachers, all kinds of people from all paths of life who've had experiences and most of us are kind of overlooking um, the signs. You know, I've spoken to some people who said they just feel irrational, all of a sudden they broke out in tears one day for no good reason. Well, there is a reason, it's called loss. Um, or that they're really not interested, they've gotten used to not getting together with people, they're just not interested in it. Maybe, maybe kind of sheltering is easier than admitting what it feels like to acknowledge, right? Yeah. Um, but there's also a gentleman whose name will come up later on the resource page, 
uh, David Sessler, who did a lot of work with Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, who wrote that book, I think back in 1969, Death and Dying in the Five Stages. And mm -hmm. he's added a sixth one that talks about being a proactive survivor. And, and he talks about finding activities and experiences that help you bring it out, but in a way that helps other people. So one of the things he says is find one trusted person and be honest about how you're feeling. That will give them permission to also become honest. And it starts a ripple effect, right? Recently, we did our nursing exemplar project where we encouraged nurses to write about their compassionate care experiences over the last year. And for many of them, it was very cathartic to turn a death and dying vigilance in an ICU into a powerful story of compassion. They could actually see where their awesome being with a patient made all the difference, right? Absolutely. And, and it was so powerful. beautiful. Yeah. Right. Um, other people I noticed are trying to build something. I don't want to say like a memorial, but they're really focused on building something in the yard or establishing something new a new process. And often when we're grieving, the best advice is it's hard to let go of our old routines, but slowly introducing one or two new things to reestablish is important. Establishing some new habits. So even like you said, you did it one day. One it day. feels awkward. Maybe you'll do it a second day. And if you don't, you have to be compassionate about not hitting it the second day. And I think Part of this reflection and part of this sitting with this loss is also figuring out what we've discovered in these last months too, right? We've learned what we value and we've learned what maybe we don't need to do anymore. I mean, I, we look at all the people changing careers, right? People making huge decisions to switch to something that is more heart-centered than maybe their, their previous employment was. So I think being able to reflect back, we can see where we just aren't fitting the way we used to, and being careful to make sure that we process that, that grief and that loss. And as we're doing that, we can see those little diamonds in the rough that we learned that we might not have been able to understand that we learned until we do this reflection. Right. So as a physician, what is your advice to people in terms of if you notice that you're feeling that kind of disconnected blah feeling, um, that you can acknowledge that things are actually starting to go better, but you just don't feel it, how long should they let that feeling go before they turn to somebody and ask for some support? I think it depends a lot on the person. I, I think especially if you find yourself not behaving like yourself, you know, so a day or two here or there, oh, yes. Everybody is entitled and that's okay, no right. big deal. Right. But I think if, if, if we start to notice that we're not ourselves, we're not behaving in the way that is um, consistent with who we know we are, that should be a flag that we need to reach out to somebody when it just becomes um, more of a pattern. And again, that's very individual for people, but I think we know, we know deep down um, and we also need to listen to signals from the people who, who know us and love us, right? So if, if, if someone is commenting, you know, Tim, are you really okay today? You, you don't seem like yourself. Once in a while, that's okay. But if that's something that you continue to hear, I think that's one of our, our signs from people who know us um, that, that maybe we're not ourselves, that maybe we need some help. Right. So um, in a lot of the research I did, they kind of use this standard, you know, if it's been a two-week period, that you haven't seen a change. So I'll put that out there just as a kind of like a baseline, not to tell everybody to use two weeks, but just as a baseline. My second thing is there's a lot of commercials lately on TV for online behavioral health services. Mm -hmm. That's not just a coincidence. If you see something like that and you think you should write it down, that, that's your intuitive self saying, write it down, let's get some help. Agreed. Don't debate, but re realize that if you think you should, you have nothing to lose by asking for help. Agreed. And for our Trinity Health colleagues, it is so simple. I will remind everybody again, there'll be a slide that references CareBridge. That's our EAP provider. When you call them, 
If you're not sure, tell them you want to talk to somebody now. They will put somebody on the phone. And for anybody, Trinity Health Employee, community, if you're not sure where to go, just remember, dial 211. It is a service run by United Way. They're going to connect you with providers. There are social workers who will talk to you in the moment. And sometimes what we all just need is somebody to say, wow, based on what you're saying, sounds like you're doing okay for right. what you've been through. And here are some things that you can do to help yourself. And they might say, wow, let's get you to talk to somebody so you can take this apart. Grief doesn't last forever. And it does go through cycles but you do recover through it. You really do. But sometimes, just like being lost in the woods, you just need a guide who's been there a couple of times so that until you realize you're okay, you have support. Yeah, so you can get that reflected back to you. And with all of the virtual care that has gone on this year, this is easier than it was to get help one or two visits even just to check in just to check in, particularly for our colleagues, because those visits are free. Those virtual consultations are free for our colleagues through our CareBridge site. So the last thing I will offer, and I know that this is a little bit of a longer one, but I really think it's an important topic, is um, for anybody listening, if your immediate thought is everybody's struggling, don't do that, please. We, we have a biology, we have mirror neurons. If all I do is look around and see everybody struggling, so I figure I should, I'm not helping myself and I'm not helping anybody else. Please don't compare. Right? There's an old saying, no, nobody's toothache hurts as much as your own, so please take care of your teeth. Just do it for you, and then notice that other people might notice you're doing better, want to know why, and then be encouraged to take care of themselves. But don't compare and say, everybody's struggling, so I should too. That's not true. Agreed. So, thank you for letting me have this conversation with you today, and I hope it helps somebody who's listening. Oh, thank you for all of your wonderful research. You're going to just touch so many people with this really important conversation. I hope. All right. I'll see you next time. I'll see you next time.